Hi everyone, um, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, today's tutorial is on inflammatory bowel diseases given by Shreya. Um, we're proud to announce that this tutorial is being sponsored by the BMA. Um, but just before we begin with the tutorial, we have Louise to give us a quick, brief 10 minute talk on how the BMA can support you. And then after that, we'll begin with the tutorial. And yep, yeah, I'll hand over to Louise now, thank you. Thank you. Hi everyone. Um, thank you to the Becoming a Doctor team um, for having me along this evening. Welcome to this short presentation that outlines how the BMA supports you throughout medical school and in particular your final year at medical school. My name is Louise Cox and I'm one of the BMA's membership managers. I actually cover the east of England and they are, there are another seven of me around the country supporting doctors and medical students on a local level. So who is the BMA? The British Medical Association is the trade union and professional association for doctors and medical students in the UK. The BMA was set up by doctors for doctors and we have collective bargaining rights which we use to negotiate the national contracts for all doctors. So when we sit around the table with government ministers they listen to us as we represent the profession in vast numbers. The MSC, the Medical Students Committee, represents medical students in the UK. And we consider and address issues of importance to medical students, and make sure that your views are represented in wider BMA policy. We continuously fight for the profession, locally, regionally, and at a national level to help improve your working lives and provide you with the support that you need to work to the best of your ability. We also offer employment support and career advice to 160,000 members and regardless of where you are in your career, the BMA is there to help guide you. So I'll just take you through the BMA's top membership benefits for medical students. Firstly, being a, a member of the BMA allows you to access the BMA library. It's the biggest medical library in Europe. Um, and if there's any UCL students on the, on the tutorial, you're probably aware that during normal conditions, you can use our library facilities as a study space. Um, if you're not based in London before COVID-19, the BMA offered a free postal service to all members up until the end of FY2 and we're hoping that will resume towards the end of the year um, when we're allowed to do so. At the moment though, if you want an ebook and we haven't got it, our library team will try and get it for you. So please feel free to email the library at the BMA. Also, when we're not in the middle of a pandemic, you can borrow up to 12 books at a time from us for a minimum of three months and a maximum of a year. And I do, I do believe that's more generous uh, loan out terms than any other university and no penalties if you return the book late. Um, and we all know how expensive medical textbooks can be, so you never need to buy one again with the BMA library. You can also access over 22 million journal articles, research services, eBooks and e-journals anywhere, anytime. And our guys in the library have um, supported so many students through their finals, and you can use our, our guys in the library as, as your search Another important membership benefit is the world famous British Medical Journal. If you are a final year medical student and you're in membership, you can upgrade to the full BMJ now if you haven't already done so. You can receive the journal every week um, by, in the print version, or we now have a state of the art app that you can download as well. As part of your free BMJ learning subscription, you get access to thousands of clinical e-learning modules. There are useful courses both for your exam revision and for completing your e-portfolio when you begin your foundation years. There are a few bullet points on here on this slide as examples of our courses. You can build your knowledge with our interactive website, including audio and video, video modules to help you learn in simulated environments. And you can keep up to date with practice change and developments with one of the world's largest and trusted online CPD providers for doctors and medical students. You can also print and download certificates as proof of your learning. The BMJ also provides support for your non-clinical skills. You can access courses that help with your medical CVs and career planning. 
Also make sure that you hit the wards running by completing courses on workload and time management, effective handovers, building professional relationships and giving and receiving useful feedback. We also provide courses on interviews, presenting and negotiating skills and you can use your BMA login to access all of these courses. Other key student benefits include discounts on Ask Dr. Clark revision classes facilitated by Dr. Bob Clark and his expert team and they are the UK's most popular revision courses. We can also help with planning and organising electives and practice questions and online resources to help you with your SJT. Another extremely important thing to know is that the BMA has a counselling and peer support. Doctors and medical students are human too and whether it be exam stress, anxiety, relationship issues, bullying, there is always somebody that you can talk to. You can call our wellbeing team 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And if you're on your first placement or are newly qualified and you don't know who to turn to, the BMA can help you. You can speak in confidence to a fellow doctor um, and a BMA member who's been trained in peer support. As a student member in any year, you can access our exciting new tool, the Specialty Explorer. You can get help making an, in, an informed choice about your specialty. It's an online psychometric test, which takes about 20 minutes to complete, and it asks all sorts of work-life balance questions. Um, I've actually sat it myself, um, so I know how long it takes and, and the sort of questions it asks. It supports your research into medical specialties and provides you with a very detailed and personalised report listing your top 10 specialties according to the answers that you give. It, it is really quick and easy to use and covers all specialties in the UK. Um, and when I'm out and about face-to-face uh, -face with students, they do get really excited about this. The, expl the Specialty Explorer report is really detailed. It's about 20 pages long. Um, and it's all about how it works out your top 10 specialties and matches your answers. It will ask questions about how important location is to you, earning potential, if you prefer a hospital or community setting, and even ask how competitive you are. And it, it also asks if you prefer your patients to be acutely ill or chronically ill. And these are screenshots from my report. And as you can see, I should have been a psychiatrist according to my answers. So to recap, if you're already a student member or when you do decide to join us, we strongly recommend that you register your BMA account to access all of the benefits. You'll receive emails that will keep you informed on political updates, guidance and resources. And you can follow us on social media for instant updates. And uh, we also at the moment, if you were to join now, you wouldn't pay any fees until October. Student fees um, are about the price of a, a coffee, actually cheaper than a coffee in London. So uh, the equivalent of one coffee a month in, in Costa. So the brilliant thing about being able to present to you today is that there is still a month free um, if you were to join. Um, so, you know, the, the more members we have, um, the stronger we are, like with any trade union. So there's my email address on here and there's a join link on here as well to ensure that if you would get the month free if you wanted to join um, and you can follow me on Twitter as well for updates. So um, I look after UCL, Cambridge, UEA and Anglia Ruskin medical schools. So if any of you guys watching attend those then I, I hope to see you um, soon. Um, and thank you for watching and listening. I just wondered, um, it, was there any questions at all? I can see some in the chat. Okay, so did BMJ, BMA courses count towards the hours we have to do? for ARCP? Um, I'm not 100% sure. Um, 
uh, but I can certainly find out and if you would like to email me I can have that answered for you tomorrow um, I hope that's okay off the top of my head I'm not 100% sure so apologies for that but you can email me and I will get the answer for you Um, is there any more? Okay, um, there's not any more questions. Um, enjoy the rest of the tutorial and thanks again to the Becoming a Doctor team for having us along this evening. Thank you, Louise, and thank you to BMA for um, supporting and sponsoring us. Um, the tutorial will begin shortly, but just before that, um, a couple of rules. If you're watching via the Zoom, if you have any questions, pop them into the Q&A or the chat, and they'll all be answered at the end. Um, for those watching on the Facebook Live, just comment your questions and we'll make sure they're passed on. Um, and that's all from me, and I'll hand over to Shreya to begin. Thank you. So hi everyone, um, I'm Shreya, I'm an intercalating medical student at Barts in the London, uh, just about to start in a few weeks time. So today I'm going to go into inflammatory bowel disease and specifically uh, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis with a focus on um, high yield content for your exams and what mostly would probably come up in your questions as uh, typical buzzwords that you need to ace the exams. So just a disclaimer, Obviously, I'm just a student. Um, I don't know everything. And, and I actually encourage if there is something that I don't necessarily know, I encourage everyone that is present to maybe share their suggestions and then we can definitely learn from each other. And also with any of the images that I've used, I've also referenced them from where you can get them. And they're actually really good resources, but I'll get onto that later on in the talk. So today with the learning objectives, um, we're gonna go over a couple of things. So the first one is to understand the features of Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. And that's with the pathophysiology, risk factors, signs and symptoms, complications, diagnosis and management. And I'll be basically comparing both of them throughout the whole thing. So you can start picking out what is the defining features and what makes them different and what makes them similar. So that would mean that we would compare and contrast both the clinical and pathological features. And again, anything that's potentially life-threatening of the complications, as well as how we would manage them. So what is IBD? What is inflammatory bowel disease? So simply put, this is um, a type of gastrointestinal dysfunction and an umbrella term for two conditions, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, both of which are characterized by chronic inflammation of the GI tract. Now, we don't exactly know that much about what the pathophysiology is of both conditions. But what I've done from my research is just draw on the main sort of uh, influences and factors that um, people are thinking about in research already and um, put it together. So this is just a page of my notes that I've taken from watching some videos online and just looking at research. So I've just combined it onto this slide. So if we look at Crohn's disease first, um, it's said to be an immune mediated condition and it has genetic and environmental influences at play here. So there's loads of pathogens, including Pseudomonas, Listeria, and Mycobacterium that can influence and possibly even cause uh, or trigger Crohn's disease. Now, um, there are other pathogens, of course, out there like E. coli, or maybe some other ones out there like Proteus and whatnot. Um, but I've just put those on the board here. But then um, these sort of pathogens will be presented into your immune system. And as natural immune systems go, your TH or your T1 helper cells will look at them and think, OK, we need to get rid of them. And as rightly as they should do in your immune system, there will be a response to get rid of anything that's uh, presenting as a pathogen. So they will release cytokines like uh, TNF alpha or interferon gamma and so on. And that will trigger off macrophages that will release free radicals, proteases, and any other sort of um, inflammatory chemicals. Now, somewhere in this process, there will be some form of unregulated step and something that's gone wrong, which will cause the GI damage that is typical of Crohn's disease. And 
alongside the pathogen presenting and there being some sort of unregulated step here, there's been some evidence and some sort of research gone into it that there must be genetic influences at play here, which I'll go into a bit later. But with the GI damage that is caused in your um, gastrointestinal tract, it goes through all the layers of the colonic wall, and that is known as transmural. So that means it will go through the mucosa, submucosa, muscularis propria, and the serosa to cause damage. And this will cause ulcers and granulomas to be present. You also have ulcerative colitis, which is very, very similar in, in terms of its pathogenesis. Again, it's genetics and environmental factors at play here. It's an autoimmune condition. And again, with in terms of the genetics, there is a gene that we'll look into. And in, in terms of environmental factors, for both Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, it can be NSAIDs, uh, antibiotics, um, stress, the diet that you could be eating. Again, it could be the gut flora and the bacteria that's present in your gut. And all those sorts of combinations of factors together can cause a gut dysbiosis, which just basically means an imbalance of what's going on. And another thing that's been as a theory um, as to what causes ulcerative colitis is that there's some gut bacteria such as E. coli, uh, Fusobacterium and so on, that um, cause more sulfur um, gas. And with more sulfur gas, there's been shown to be more inflammation. Um, and with that whole uh, combination of genetics and environmental factors, again, there will be some sort of unregulated step within your immune response that will cause tissue injury. Uh, but this time it will only be in the mucosa and submucosa. And normally ulcerative colitis only affects the colon, whereas Crohn's will affect uh, the whole GI tract. So there's a typical phrase, mouth to anus. Um, so it can be anything in between um, that in the GI tract, whereas ulcerative colitis is specific really just to the colon. And the most common site is the rectum. So if we look at epidemiology and the risk factors associated, um, this will start looking at the differences between the conditions. So with Crohn's disease, the median age of onset is around 30. Um, there's loads of different like resources online that will have varying slightly different ages, but I've said about 30 as the median age of onset. And the peak incidence would be something very early on between 15 and 30, but obviously you can have it on either side of that. And then with your risk factors, you've got the card 15, well, it's now known as CARD15. It's typically known as NOD2. So you might still see um, the phrase NOD2 for that specific gene. Now, this gene um, apparently is a frame shift mutation. So that basically means there's either been an insertion or a deletion of one code that has led to um, your triplet codons being um, coding for different amino acids in a protein. So there must be some sort of um, dysfunction and mutation within the protein. This has been linked to family history. So it's more likely that if you do have um, a family member with Crohn's, uh, it's more likely to be passed on. And again, smoking is one of those things that I will go into again in a few slides time, but smoking is a environmental risk factor that has been seen to trigger Crohn's disease. So then you have ulcerative colitis and it's slightly different in terms of its age distribution. So there's a bimodal distribution with 15 to 25 year olds um, getting it earlier on, but then there's also a second peak of people getting it later on with about 55 to 70. But again, these dates can slightly, um, these ages can slightly change. Um, and it's not to say that you won't get it at different ages either. So again, with the risk factors, you've got HLA B27. Now I've put up in a little box here, um, HLA B27 specifically, because this is a classic exam question that they um, like putting up about what sort of conditions are associated with this. Uh, there's over about 100 conditions that are associated, but the main ones that have been shown to have a strong influence have been ulcerative colitis alongside ankylosing spondylitis, reactive arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, as well as IBD, as I just said. So um, you can also have other risk factors like uh, being Caucasian, being a non-smoker. So it's quite the opposite in this sense that if you don't smoke or you stop smoking, uh, you're more likely to develop ulcerative colitis, whereas in Crohn's, it's more likely that you would develop, um, the, the disease progression would be worse if you were smoking. And 
And NSAIDs, antibiotics, uh, again, gut pathogens, anything like that can be risk factors as well. So as I said earlier, Crohn's disease with smoking, it will accelerate and worsen the progression of the disease. And the best way to treat that is to just say, um, stop smoking, and it's an effective treatment. Whereas for ulcerative colitis, the onset of uh, ulcerative colitis will commonly follow someone that's either stopped smoking or just hadn't smoked at all. Now, I just thought I'd put this out here that in, in some, there's been some sort of research out there that shows with a randomized control trial that nicotine patches have been seen to be as effective as um, five acids, which are a type of treatment drug that we'll go into later. So I'm just going to put the knowledge check up and you guys can have a go at this question. Okay, I'm just waiting for a few more of you to vote. Okay, I'll end the poll now. So I'll just share the results. So yeah, well done to the most of, most of you that said rheumatoid arthritis. So that's the one that isn't associated with HLA B27 and actually is associated with um, HLA DR4. So slight difference, but um, something that is also tested. So make sure you know the differences and what rheumatoid arthritis is associated with. Okay, so histopathology. Now this is the classic bit where I'm going to go over all the exam buzzwords. So this includes, um, we're going to look at it macroscopically and microscopically. So this will include um, what you'd see on endoscopy and colonoscopy and what you would probably see on a histology slide. So if we start off macroscopically with Crohn's disease, you would notice that your bowel would look much more thickened and that there would be presence of deep ulcers and fissures in the mucosa that will produce a cobblestone appearance. Now, the phrase cobblestone appearance, you can probably imagine something like a cobblestone street that you're walking on. Um, and I've got a picture later on describing that as well. And you'd also get the presence of fistulae and abscesses, um, which are quite common and a very big divining factor of what it would be Crohn's as opposed to ulcerative colitis. So anything that I've highlighted in blue and bold is probably going to lead you in one direction over the other and is an exam buzzword for your SBAs. Now with ulcerative colitis, your mucosa would just be reddened and friable, but there might be um, some inflammatory pseudo polyps that are present from being just masses of scar tissue. Microscopically on a histology slide, your Crohn's disease patients would probably have transmural inflammation. And as, as I said earlier, that is basically all, all the layer of um, the colon wall being affected and lymphoid hyperplasia and granulomas. Now that basically means a lot of lymphocytes will be present on your histology slide and will form something called a granuloma, which I'll show you in a second. Ulcerative colitis will have much more of a inflammatory cell infiltrate of your lamina propria specifically, um, but you also get a lot of distortion of your crypt architecture. Now you could either get cryptitis, you could get crypt abscesses, which are worse than cryptitis. Um, and crypt abscesses normally have quite a lot of neutrophils within the crypts. And you can also get something called goblet cell depletion. So I'll just show you some pictures here. And I've referenced the ones that uh, where the images have come from. So you could always go back and find out the, uh, the descriptions and them going back in quite into detail with the descriptions. So with Crohn's disease, you can see this massive sort of circular like structure here, which would be a granuloma. So if you ever see um, some sort of circular looking pattern in your histology, it might be granuloma, and in this case, it is a non-caseating granuloma, meaning it is non-necrotizing. 
You've also got ulcerative colitis here. And specifically, I want to just highlight this much darker purpley blue section here, which shows the um, infiltrate and it's much more present with um, lymphoid infiltrate and inflammation down here. But you can also see in general, the crypts have started to start um, distorting. So I would recommend looking at normal pictures of what normal um, histology and what normal bowel should look like, and then start comparing it with a range of diseases. So you can start seeing the differences. There was also another tutorial by Becoming a Doctor in their previous series on IBD, which goes much more into detail with the histology. So I recommend that as well. And I saw um, an image by Armando Hasudogan. He does great YouTube channel um, tutorials on a load of topics. And he specifically had this image of what it would look macroscopically. So as I mentioned, the cobblestoning, uh, um, cobblestoning appearance on Crohn's disease, you can see that it sort of cuts off in between. So it looks more like a cobblestone street. And it's also got the presence of a fissure um, which is basically just a tear that happens and it's quite common uh, as anal fissures most commonly. And then with ulcerative colitis, you get the pseudo polyps, which are basically those lumps of masses of scar tissue that happen around um, your mucosa. And you also get your loss of house jar, which are just like markings on the side of your bowel. So we're going to do another knowledge check. And with this, upon histology, which is a characteristic feature of Crohn's disease only. So I'll just launch the poll. Okay, let's give you a few more seconds for everyone to vote. Okay, I think that's everyone. So I'll just end it and just share. Okay, so if I go through all the options, so the answer was transmural inflammation with lymphoid hyperplasia and granulomas. But we'll start with um, A and work our way down. So with A, it's signet ring cells, and that is typical of gastric cancers. So that is something totally different to IBD and is unrelated to this topic, but it's just something I put there to throw anyone off. Um, but well done to everyone because they didn't get tricked out. Uh, then there's also inflammatory cell infiltrate in lamina propria. Now that is a characteristic feature of ulcerative colitis. So we've got the right answer there that I just showed you previously with the granulomas. Uh, with D, you've got crypt hyperplasia and villus atrophy. That's typical buzzwords for celiac disease. And you've got goblet cell depletion and crypt abscesses, which is another buzzword for ulcerative colitis. So now we're going to look into signs and symptoms. So first of all, where is the information? Now, this is where you can, again, sort of differentiate where the, um, where the disease is and what the disease could be out of both IBD types. So with ulcerative colitis, it will affect usually um, the lower part. So the rectum is the most common part that can be affected. However, with further disease progression, it could extend to involved sigmoid. Um, descending colon, so that would be known as left-sided colitis, or it could actually involve the entire colon. In some instances, it could involve the distal part of the ty uh, terminal ileum, and this is called backwash ileitis. And again, it is a term that you can search up and go into further detail with, um, but that is actually quite uh, not as common as uh, just having the rectum, which is the most common thing to get affected. Uh, with Crohn's disease, it's actually any part of the GI tract. So that's the typical phrase, as I said earlier, mouth to anus. But it does have typical affinity for the terminal ileum and the ascending colon. But it's not to say that you won't um, get it anywhere else. And you can also um, involve multiple areas, but they will have normal areas of bowel in between. So it will be called skip lesions. Whereas ulcerative colitis, wherever it affects, it will affect that whole section. 
Crohn di Crohn's disease would have an area of effect, it will be fine, an area of effect, and then it will be fine. So that's a skip lesion. So with signs and symptoms, I've just split them into both. Um, if we look through the signs first, um, a fever is more typical of Crohn's disease, but it's not to say that um, you may not get it in a very severe ulcerative colitis, but it's just much more common in Crohn's disease because you'd get um, anal fissures, abscesses, and so on as complications. You'd get blood upon a digital rectal examination if you did that on the patient, um, purely because blood and mucus in the stool is much more common in ulcerative colitis. Extra intestinal manifestations, which I'll go on to in the next slide. Tenderness in the abdomen, typically because they are facing abdominal pain. And as I said earlier, they would get perianal disease in Crohn's, which if you have an anal abscess um, as, a, um, as a result of a fissure or a fistula, then you'd get that fever. With the symptoms, however, um, as I said, you get abdominal pain, tenesmus, which is basically uh, that feeling of incomplete evacuation. You felt like you had to go, um, but you don't feel um, that um, it's all evacuated. Then you've got blood and mucus in the stool. Again, like I said, much more common in ulcerative colitis, diarrhea, common in both. It's typical um, IBD in general. And weight loss, again, could happen in both, but it's much more common and more likely to happen in Crohn's disease. Now with the extra intestinal manifestations, we've got um, a range of areas where it can happen in the body. Again, the etiology as to why this happens is quite unknown. And I tried looking into it, um, but there's not much that I could possibly find on it. But if we start with the eyes, you'll, um, you might get uveitis, so, um, but that you could also get episcleritis and so on. So something, um, a part of your eye may get inflamed. Then with the joints, as I said, ankylosing spondylitis is associated with ulcerative colitis with the HLA B27 gene. So there you might get an association. You could also get arthralgia and sacralitis, which are also um, quite common when you have one or the other. And you can also get um, some other sort of joint problems. Bones wise, you can get osteoporosis and they've definitely highlighted that in Crohn's disease patients before. Liver, you can, and this is the main one that I wanted to highlight, which is primary sclerosing cholangitis, because I know on PassMed and all these other um, uh, question platforms out there, they love asking about this. So primary sclerosing cholangitis is associated with ulcerative colitis, and they love asking that in exam questions or on practice questions and so on. So that's the key one that I wanted to highlight today. And this is basically um, primary sclerosing cholangitis um, in a short way of me saying this, is basically a fibrosing of the bile ducts. And it's not really known why it happens, but there's a theory that from all the inflammatory cytokines and uh, pro-inflammatory markers that are released as a result of ulcerative colitis, um, some of it will enter the uh, enter enterohepatic um, circulation and end up at the um, uh, bile ducts and the biliary system. And it gets stuck there, leading to the fibrosis of your bile duct. But you could also get um, other things like fatty liver, gallstones. You can also get other kidney stones. And you can also get these skin conditions um, and the um, key uh, signs called erythema nodosum and pyoderma gangrenosum, which are the two signs that I think um, could possibly come up in like data interpretation exams or anything like that. So um, credit to Dermnet. In general, for dermatology, I think Dermnet is one of the best resources there. Um, so pyoderma gangrenosum is a form of ulceration that normally happens on the leg. Um, and again, with all these manifestations, most of them are quite common to both uh, Crohn's disease and ulcerative um, colitis. And erythema nodosum is just, again, redness, um, again, most likely to appear on the legs. So then with diagnosis, um, pretty much the steps to figure out which one it is, is pretty much the same. So you would want to do blood tests first and you would want to look at um, full blood count. You want to look at the inflammatory markers. So like ESR or CERP, using these LFT. So you do all the usual stuff. Um, look at ferritin, B12, folate and blood cultures. And with ferritin, B12 and folate, you might notice that it's slow because with inflammatory bowel conditions, uh, you're not actually absorbing 
uh, all the nutrients and everything uh, well. So you could lead to anemia and you could also have low vitamin D um, because there's also vitamin D that's going to get generated from the gut as well. Um, you'd also get raised inflammatory markers because this is an obviously an inflammatory process. And you would do a stool test. Now with stool test, um, you'd want to, first of all, exclude anything else that could cause the diarrhea. So this is just some um, pathogens that I've said that can cause it. So like C. diff, E. coli, there's a range out there. I've just put a few here. Um, but then you also want to do the typical one that they um, love asking. And it's, um, uh, they love asking this in exams and so on, which is fecal calprotectin. And this is a protein that can be found uh, in your stool and is a marker of IBD. So you'd have an increased fecal calprotectin as a result of increased neutrophils, I believe. And this is a clear way of knowing that um, you're looking at inflammatory bowel disease. Now, so far, this is only going to really tell you you've got inflammatory bowel disease. It's not going to really tell you, um, is it going to be UC or is it going to be CD? You'd want to do an x-ray and you also, gold standard, you want to do a colonoscopy and a biopsy. And that goes back to all the findings I mentioned earlier in the histopathology section where I talked about macroscopic and microscopic findings. Now, if on colonoscopy you see a cobblestone appearance with fissures and ulcers, you're most likely going to say Crohn's. Uh, but if you just see friable reddened mucosa with pseudopolyps, you're probably going to think this might be ulcerative colitis. Now with a biopsy, you'd look much more microscopically into that. And then if we just recap again, with Crohn's, you're going to look at for granulomas, you're going to maybe even see um, some infiltrate, but you would see much more uh, infiltrate in the lamina propria for ulcerative colitis and crypt. Uh, cryptitis or crypt abscesses or goblet cell depletion. Now with ulcerative colitis, there's also um, a t uh, an index, um, a criteria of figuring out if it's a mild col uh, colitis, moderate or severe. Now, I thought we'd spend some time just going through each of them, but it is one of those things where you just have to probably look at it a few times um, and in a way just to revise for your exams and so on. But the parameters that they use include bowel movements. Now, if you have less than four, they consider that to be mild colitis. But if it was six or more, it'd be considered severe. They also look at the amount of blood that would be present in your bowel movements. If it's quite small, they consider it to be mild. But if it's large, it's more likely to be severe. Of course, the more there, there's going to be, probably the worse it is. Now, temperature, they're looking for pyrexia when it comes to severe ulcerative colitis. In general, apyrexial, or you might even just have, I still think that's pretty normal between 37.1 to 37.8. I don't think that's too bad. It's just once you're getting much more of um, a temperature, it could be considered a bit more severe. Heart rate, you're looking at um, um, under 70 for it to be mild, but over 90, um, it's severe. Hemoglobin, again, you're looking for um, them to be quite anemic at less than 105 for um, severe. And this is the last one. So it's ES, ESR, but there's also CRP. So if you look at a few different types of um, true love and wits criteria, some use ESR and some use CRP, but essentially they need to um, look at an inflammatory marker for one of their parameters. And I've used ESR here. Um, mild would be less than 30, but severe would be more than 30. If it was CRP, though, um, it would just be more than 45 for severe. Um, so this is just something to look again in your own time. But we'll do another knowledge check to see um, if you can recognize it just by this. I'll give it a few more seconds as well. Oops. 
Okay, I will leave it at that and just share. So the correct answer is CRP with over 30. Um, so it actually should have said ESR, but um, CRP with over 45, either one works. The other four, however, wouldn't have worked purely because um, A, in terms of bowel movements, they want more than six. Temperature is 37.8. However, quite a few true love and wits criteria are a bit arbitrary with their figures and they can be they can change slightly. I've just gone with the one that I've um, saw the most common figures from. With heart rate, it was um, over 90 to be severe, so that would be moderate. And hemoglobin needed to be under 105. So the other four are moderate criteria for ulcerative colitis, but um, your inflammatory markers over 30 would be severe. Okay, so we'll look at complications now, and I'm going to show a couple of radiological findings as well, just to show um, a couple more data interpretation ways that they could use in exams and so on. So first of all, looking at all the complications they could have. So Crohn's disease, small bowel obstruction is um, quite common, and um, that's purely because you can get uh, quite a lot of inflammation in your um, ileum as well as your small bowel. You can get malabsorption, and that's also known as small bowel disease. And to be fair, in ulcerative colitis, you can also get mal malabsorption. Um, it's much more common for you to see in your blood tests, uh, low B12, folate, ferritin, and so on in Crohn's, uh, just because it has much more of an affinity for the ileum. Then you have anal and perianal disease, and that includes fissures, skin tags, perianal abscesses, fistulas. So as I said earlier, you may get that characteristic fever as a sign. And just a note on small bowel obstruction as well, that might be the first time they're actually presenting and finding out that they have Crohn's disease as well. And you can also get fistulas uh, with Crohn's disease too. With ulcerative colitis, uh, the two main ones that I put down are toxic megacolon, which is a dilatation of the colon wall. And you will see that on a abdominal x-ray to be more than six centimeters. There is a perfor perforation risk when um, your colon is dilated to more than six centimeters. And it's normally your transverse colon that is dilated. Um, and this usually will require surgery if it's not resolved in the first 48 hours. Then you also get um, a higher, like a slightly higher risk with colorectal cancer with ulcerative colitis compared to Crohn's. It's not that there isn't a complication or a risk of colorectal cancer with Crohn's too, but it's just more likely with ulcerative colitis and you would screen them and um, just monitor that they are all fine. And just wanna put a little data interpretation tip here. When you're looking at x-rays, there is a three, six, nine rule. So if it's three centimeters on an abdominal x-ray, it's most likely the small bowel and that's what it should be. Six centimeters is the large bowel and six, uh, nine centimeters would be your cecum. Anything bigger, you're looking at something that probably needs to be seen to. So I'll just look at some x-rays. Now, I really recommend radiopedia.org. You may have seen these images before on PassMed, and um, they get them from radiopedia.org as well. And um, there's loads of cases there that people upload x-rays, films, CT scans, and so on, with explanations of what's going on. So I recommend that um, source really well. So what we've got here is something called a lead pipe colon. And you see that in ulcerative colitis. And this is of the transverse colon. Now, this is characteristic um, showing that there's the loss of the horse markings. And it's much more of a smooth appearance throughout, if you can see as highlighted by the red arrows. And then you also have in this image, the second image here, um, this is just something that I wanted to highlight, the fact that there are no skip lesions. It's just, um, in this case, affecting pretty much the whole colon, um, and it's throughout the whole thing. If it was skip lesions and it would be Crohn's, there'd be a bit of an effect here, and then it would be normal bowel and then be affected again. Now, here's another image of a to toxic megacolon. So you're looking for over six centimeters in terms of um, the criteria for uh, dilatation. And so you can see this bit here is much, much more dilated than the rest of the colon. 
And in Crohn's disease, you've also got something called a Cantor string sign. Now, um, this is just basically a, a, a really narrow part of the bowel, and but it can also happen in uh, colorectal cancer and some other conditions as well. So it's not just specific to Crohn's disease, but if you were to compare ulcerative colitis and Crohn's, you'd see this sign um, in Crohn's. And I'm not really entirely sure why that happens, but um, as far as I know, you just get a narrowing and it usually again would happen uh, around the ileum just because there's more of an affinity there. So time for another knowledge check. What is the cutoff for the toxic megacolon? Okay, just give a few more seconds. You guys answered really quickly on this one. Okay. So yeah, you all pretty much got it right. So yes, it might not be um, good if it is either 1.5 or two times the normal size, but the actual cutoff you're looking for is over six centimeters. And that's what they um, term. And that's what I've seen anyway. Um, so I'd go over six centimeters. So if we just recap the three, six, nine rule, three is for small bowel, six is for large bowel, and nine is for the cecum. Uh, okay, so now we're on to the final bit of this presentation, which is the management and how we actually treat the um, patients that either have ulcerative colitis or Crohn's. So I just wanted to point out some medications here. So we have your five acids or amino silates, and um, typical ones are sulfasalazine and mesalazine. And I just got some side effects that um, are pretty good to know about, and they like testing one. And I've definitely seen some of these questions being asked on past med before as well. So um, typical ones are nausea and vomiting, and that's typical pretty much of most medications. But you get bone marrow suppression, male infertility, and hemolysis associated with sulfasalazine. And pancreatitis is known to have a slight increased risk with mesalazine over sulfasalazine. And your thiopurines, which inhibit a purine synthesis, uh, which specifically are for your T cells, um, they'll be targeting your T cells. That would be azathioprine and mercaptopurine. And side effects again include nausea and vomiting, pancreatitis, bone marrow suppression. And when administering these sorts of drugs, you want to measure this TMPT enzyme before, because this is the enzyme that would break down and ensure that you wouldn't have too much of a high level of either azathioprine or mercaptopurine in your bloodstream. And that way you would stop the BM suppression. So again, with management, there's no real easy way of learning this. I just feel like with more practice and more questions, you'd be able to, um, get the hang of it, but I've tried to, um, as neatly as possible, put this into a table. Um, as we saw with the true love and wits criteria, we know how to determine something as mild, moderate, or severe. Um, but we can also look at the extent of disease to also categorize it as mild, moderate, or severe. So proctitis, where it's just um, with the rectum um, being affected, is probably going to be mild. Whereas the more extensive the disease goes, so proctosigmoiditis, uh, so rectum and sigmoid, could also be mild, but the more it starts to progress and get extensive, it could go moderate and severe. So with mild colitis, you want to give a topical assa first, and uh, that's for the rectum. And you give that for about four weeks. Um, and if there was no improvement to induce remission, and remission basically means you want to, everything to go back to normal, so they're feeling um, happy and fine, um, then you'd probably give an oral assa as well. Or sometimes you might want to give an oral or a topical corticosteroid if the oral assa doesn't work. It's really about what works for the patient the best. Um, to maintain, um, maintain remission once um, the patient is out of um, the flare that they're having, you'd want to give a topical, again, a topical assa rectally, or you can give it rectally 
um, with an oral assay um, as an adjunct as well. Then for moderate, it's quite similar. You want to give a uh, topical assay first. If that doesn't work, you want to add an oral one. And if that doesn't work, you'd probably give a topical corticosteroid. Same again with maintenance. Um, again, you'd want to give topical assays and maybe an oral one. Just giving an oral one by itself is probably not going to help as much. So they like to put it in combination. And then with severe ulcerative colitis, you're looking at IV corticosteroids. Um, if that's contraindicated in the patient, you might give psychosporin or um, in really worst cases, maybe infliximab or something like that and consider surgery. For maintenance, you're looking at oral azothioprine and mercaptopurines, so your thiopurines, if the person had two or more exacerbations, more, uh, two or more flares in the past year. For Crohn's disease, you can get, um, again, I've just roughly put it into mild to moderate and severe cases and flares. So to induce remission, you're initially going to give glucocorticoids like prednisolone or budesonide, um, for your mild to moderate patients. And if you feel like they need a little bit more, then you can give a 5 assa, but it's pretty, pretty useless by itself just for Crohn's disease. And thiopurines can be added on as well if needed, but um, they should never be used as a monotherapy for mild to moderate Crohn's disease. Now to maintain, you also want to make sure they're stopping smoking because smoking worsens the disease progression. And you also got azothioprine and mercaptopurine that you can give. Um, methotrexate is used as a second line to azothioprine or mercaptopurine, um, but it's not really recommended in ulcerative colitis. Also in patients with Crohn's disease, you may want to um, give them enteral feeding for about six to eight weeks um, for, until everything is fine. And that normally includes um, drinking some sort of shakes instead, or um, they might be given shakes or they'll be given enteral feeding. It really depends on um, what's best for the patient. For severe, um, you're looking at fluid replacement, um, IV steroids like hydrocortisone and so on. Infliximab um, is anti-TNF therapy. Um, so you're looking at that as well. And surgery is probably the thing that, um, when in severe cases is the thing that they're really considering here. Um, and that couldn't, again, with surgery, it could just be the part that's affected. But um, again, with the extent of the disease, it could be the whole colon. So it really depends how extensive the disease is. And then again, you wanna maintain that they don't smoke. And I, would, I just said here, the recommended treatment following the surgery. Um, so they may be told to probably still take some sort of, um, medication after the surgery, um, depending on what, um, what are the chances of them getting the disease back. So our final knowledge check of today, if I just bring it up. Okay, just a few more seconds. Okay. Okay, so our anti-TNF therapy would be infliximab. Um, so azothioprine and mercaptopurine are your thiopurines that inhibit purine synthesis. Mesalazine is a 5 assa and budesonide is a steroid. So that basically covers everything for colorectal um, inflammatory bowel conditions. I've put a comparison here um, that you can look into your own, own time. The slides will be available for you as well. And in this comparison, I've mainly just put the things that will probably make you lead to one thing over the other. And my main takeaway messages for this talk is the pathophysiology is unclear, but I think it is mainly just a com combination of environmental and genetic influences at play that when combined, you're most likely going to get some form of IBD. Smoking will protect those with ulcerative colitis, but will accelerate disease progression in those with Crohn's disease. So it's much worse in Crohn's. Um, in terms of your exams, 
the classic words will come from your histological findings and your x-ray appearances. So make sure you learn those. There's a load of therapies that are uh, involved and the way they are ordered and how you should take them. And I just feel like that as well as the true, uh, true love and wits criteria is just something that I would practice like writing out again and again or any way that you remember, but also uh, doing the questions on PassMed and other um, sites as well, because they will put them in practice for you. And just take your time to understand the differences thoroughly because um, once you get the, the words um, in your head, you'll probably be able to recognize it pretty quickly. So that's me done for this um, uh, lecture. It would be really appreciated if you could fill in the feedback form for becoming a doctor, um, as well as for me, because it'd be really useful to know what would be uh, good to use next time. But I'm happy to answer any questions. Don't think we have any questions. Hinnal, is there any questions? Nope. Nope. Okay, cool. So I think we can just end it here. Should I keep it on for a few more minutes or? Cool. So I'll just leave this page, but thank you very much for coming guys. <laughs>